welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, September 4th, we are studying Psalm 119, verses 57 to 64. In today's text, we pray that God would turn our feet quickly and at all times to follow the way of his word, along with all those who fear him. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor Kurt Ulmer. Pastor Ulmer serves at Faith Lutheran Church in Wiley, Texas. Pastor Ulmer, welcome to Sharper Iron. Yeah, Pastor Apple, great to be with you this morning. So Pastor Ulmer, as we get started today, uh, just remind us about Psalm, well, the book of Psalms as a whole, and Psalm 119 a little more generally to help us have some context as we prepare to look at our section for today. Sure. So the book of Psalms is uh, essentially a book of prayers. It's often referred to as the prayer book of the Bible. Uh, And so in it, God has provided uh, faithful words that we may speak to him. So often we may want to pray to God and are just not quite sure what to pray. Well, here the Lord has so graciously provided for us words that are faithful and true for all kinds of circumstances. Uh, So we can always open the book of Psalms and find a prayer suitable uh, to whatever it is that we are going through, be that trials and tribulations or times of prayer and praise, uh, thanksgiving to God for his great mercy in Christ. Um, So just a wonderful treasure uh, of uh, of our faith that uh, we we would do well to pick up more regularly because as we use the psalms uh, and pray from them they actually teach us then in our more informal prayers we find that the words of the psalms begin to come out on their own it's really really quite fantastic absolutely yeah we, we've talked about that and, and then a couple of other Uh, episodes that as we read the Psalms, as God speaks to us, we learn how to speak back to him and and the the riches of his word fill our prayers and and truly benefit our faith. In in terms of, you know, the Psalms being a book of prayer, I think we often remember that. The Psalms are also a book of doctrine. Can you talk a little bit about that reality from the Psalms and the doctrine that they teach us as well? Sure. Uh, Luther comments on this, actually, and uh, notes that I think he even asked the question, you know, what are the Psalms but a, a commentary on the first commandment or a confession of the first commandment that uh, they're the only true God uh, is the only one who can help us in all of our times of need. And so uh, throughout uh, the Psalter, uh, we, we see all manner of doctrine uh, being confessed, the doctrine of his providence, the doctrine uh, of his mercy, the doctrine, the, the doctrine of uh, law and gospel, uh, mercy and atonement are all over the place uh, in, in the Psalms. So there really uh, isn't a, a doctrine that we can't find in some way uh, in, the, in the Psalms uh, as a beautifully as a form of prayer, which I don't know that we often tie those two together, doctrine and prayer, but they are absolutely meant uh, to go together. As I was preparing uh, for uh, the sermon for this upcoming Sunday, uh, the 12th Sunday after Trinity, we're on the, the one-year cycle. Uh, we hear about the, uh, the healing of the deaf mute and uh, how If we are going to speak rightly of God, first we have to hear rightly of God, and we we hear so rightly of God in the Psalms, um, in in all the various doctrines, justification, sanctification, uh, all of these things are are touched on uh, in, in the Psalms so beautifully. 
All right. So with those things in mind about the Psalms as a whole, talk to us a little more specifically about Psalm 119 and some of its its features. So Psalm 119, um, most people may know or think of it as the great Psalm of the Word. Uh, and it it may even get redundant as you're going through to hear about, you know, the word, the law, the commandments, the statutes, the precepts, uh, the rules, um, all of these things where uh, David is writing for us, um, uh, praying uh, about the word of God, extolling uh, that it is our life, it is our good, it is our salvation. And he uh, uh, touches on that even in the section that we are going to talk about today. Um, uh, most people may know, uh, maybe maybe not, that it's in a what might be known as an acrostic, so it's broken into sections, each one uh, in the Hebrew, not the English, uh, each section beginning with the that letter of uh, the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and uh, uh, it it is a what you know we have from uh, verse a hundred uh, three uh, that the the beautiful verse uh, your word is a lamp uh, I'm sorry 105 your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path most people are probably very familiar with that uh, verse and that's kind of a nice summation of the entire psalm. Uh, that in God's word, we have all that we need uh, for our life in Christ. Nothing has been withheld from us that we need for, uh, for salvation. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a beautiful poem about the word of God. As you said, there is certainly repetition, but I, I've discovered just going through it, you know, one one section at a time, eight verses at a time, that that repetition doesn't get doesn't get boring. There's always <laughs> something new to to see and to learn and to recognize. There's a number of images that get repeated, but they mm-hmm. invite you to look at them in in different ways. We'll talk a little bit about feet today and the way. That's a, an image that's common, and and yet you know we get to to reflect on it in a new way. I, I think. One of the things that, and we'll get to talk about this again later, but there's a, in today's section that I don't know that I've, I've encountered yet in Psalm 119, there's this thought of being not only the, I'm on this way in the Word of God, but there are others along with me. There's the, the church involved in this. And so even as there is repetition, there's a repetition with intensity or repetition with addition, such that there is something always new to learn, and it, it doesn't get boring if we're willing to let the Word of God speak to us. Exactly. You know, we, we want, it, if the Lord feels that uh, it needs to be said again, then there is something there to learn, uh, some new angle from which we can look at um, uh, our Lord's work for us. And so, exactly, the, the repetition uh, not only is a great way to just bury it in our hearts, but also to give us an opportunity uh, to ponder. We hear about Mary pondering the things that are said in her heart, and that is something that we need to do uh, more often, is really just sit slowly with the Word of God um, and consider it. We think in our modern day, we tend to just breeze right through it, we read the words, there you go, but to pick them apart and actually ask what is being said here, um, and, you know, if you're able to read even several sections of Psalm 119, say, okay, so why is it said this way this time, but now here we hear it in a slightly different way? What is what is God kind of teasing out here uh, that my faith may be strengthened? Yeah, yeah, it's a marvelous thing. So we get the section, uh, all these begin with Hebrew, the, the letter keith, which is like the, the hard H, the kh sort of sound that you might know from German as well. That's mm-hmm. we, we have that in Hebrew as well. That's the beginning letter of all the, the words of each line. We're starting at verse 57. Yes. Why don't we, uh, we'll read those verses, and then we can kind of pour through them. Okay. Sounds Here. good. I'll... I'll go ahead and read the the whole section, and then we'll come back and and talk about them one at a time. Great. 
All right, verse 57 and following. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. That's the text for today, Psalm 119, verses 57 to 64. All right, Pastor Elmer, we'll, we'll go verse by verse. Take us into the first part of verse 57. The Lord is my portion. Sure, and if I could just briefly before we do that, uh, I, I like to, um, as we're reading through and praying a psalm, any of them, uh, I like to remind folks, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll read something in the psalm and you think, gosh, that, you know, I'm saying something about myself that I just don't feel is true. Yeah. Uh, and we will touch on this again as we come to it, but always be thinking... Uh, first of these words in the mouth of Christ himself, uh, the, the God-man who took on our flesh and did all as we ought to do. And then we can, uh, in him, think of ourselves uh, as the I, as the redeemed yeah. of whom these things are true in him. So, uh, because even this first phrase, the Lord is my portion, uh, that is, um, uh, it, it calls to us to think upon what is our good? What is it that we most treasure in this life? And uh, it's easy for us, of course, as we think about the first commandment, you, know, you shall have no other gods. Uh, that's really what this is. Uh, what is your God? Uh, and here it uses the term portion. Uh, sometimes we can, uh, it'll use the word inheritance. The Lord is my inheritance, what I, what I gain. And I think a lot of times it's easy to get caught up thinking uh, that as a Christian, my good is, it might be peace, it might be less suffering. Uh, it may even be, oh, I'm going to go to heaven, and that's what I get for all of eternity. But this calls to us to remind us the good is God himself. Yeah. He alone is good. He gives good. He is the giver of life. And so what it is that we are after is to be uh, one again with God. Uh the Jesus prays uh, that um, and exhorts his disciples, right, that we may be one with him, that the, he is in us as the Father is in him, uh, that he is our treasure, our good. Uh, and when we have him, nothing else in this world uh, really can trouble us. It, it still does, and that brings us... Uh, uh, unrest, but in truth, uh, nothing in this world, as it says in, as Paul says in Romans 8, nothing in this world can take from us the love of God in Christ Jesus, so we can remain settled when the Lord is our portion uh, and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the connection of the of the inheritance. I think that's a, a good one. And the, so the inheritance that we receive is the good portion, the best portion. And and this language of portion, every time I, I hear it in the scriptures, it reminds me of the, the best hymn that's in the hymnal, Pastor Elmer, which is, Lord, thee I love with all my heart. Ah, uh, yeah. You, you know, I mean, and, and it's in that first stanza that, uh, what are we, earth has no pleasure I would share, yea, heaven itself were void and bare, if thou, Lord, wert not near me, and should my heart for sorrow break, my trust in thee can nothing shake, thou art the portion I have sought, thy precious blood my soul has bought. It's, it's such a beautiful thought that, that God is our, our good portion, that, that will not be taken from us. I mean, to, to connect that to the way Jesus speaks to, to Martha and to Mary in Luke chapter 10, this is the good portion. He himself, as he gives himself in his word, that is, is what we have, and, and, what a, and there's nothing better. 
Right. Uh, there's another hymn that I thought of, uh, Sing Praise to God, the Highest Good, the mm-hmm. author of our salvation. Uh, just that is our good, to be with him and to have his life uh, in, in the midst of anything. Uh, we find great comfort and peace in that alone. Mm. Now, the, the second half of verse 57, I promise to keep your words. That perhaps is one of those places where we wonder, how can I pray this? It's good to, to keep in mind these are the, the prayers of Christ first. Uh, talk to us about this promise. Sure. So the, this promise and this uh, language comes up again, interestingly, uh, just uh, in the next verse, because it talks about God's promise, according to his promise, Um We do. How many of us have, oh yes, Lord, I'm going to keep your word. We wake up, we have great plans. I'm going to, I'm going to do it today, oh Lord. And not very long later, we have fallen. Uh, But we, and and this is the balance that uh, we have to live in as Christians is, uh, or maybe tension is the better word, that uh, we do want the new man, uh, um, given birth in holy baptism, nourished and fed by God's word and Christ's body and blood, uh, do desire these things and and really fervently want to uh, walk according to the fullness of God's word. And that's pleasing to God, of course, but we're wrestling with this old man who wants anything but that. Um, so we, we promise, we desire, uh, and we pray. We pray that God would give us strength to do that. Um, uh, that in the hour of temptation, we would still cling to his word. Uh, but we recognize, of course, that I, I have not as I should, uh, but Christ has. Christ did keep the the word of God, and the when we what we're actually promising when we say we will keep His word, uh, and this is very important throughout Scripture. Uh, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Christ says. Uh, that sometimes we narrow that down too much to uh, oh I'm going to do the Ten Commandments I'm going to be good is is often what we we think of that uh, but I, it's helpful I think here that it's been translated as words rather than commandments just to help keep us out of that loop that this keeping is actually a guarding a protecting if you think of a castle keep. Uh, that's where something was protected yeah. under guard so that no one could come in and either take it away or, um, uh, or, or mess with it in any way. And so what, what we're actually promising here is not so much that we are going to be good, but that we are going to give our whole attention and devotion uh, to guarding the word of God in our heart, that no one would take it away from us, both law and gospel, uh, that, uh, that whether we're in the midst of uh, great suffering or trial, uh, or in the midst of great joy, uh, we will not let the word of God be taken from us, either in our heart or even in things like, I'm not going to let the world distract me from things like uh, my daily devotions or uh, attending the divine service on Sunday morning, that I may hear the word, the word of God, be nourished and fed uh, and, um, uh, and, and saved by that word and receiving the, the body and blood of Christ. So this idea of guarding and protecting that word, not because it needs our defense, but because we need to be on guard against all those who would snatch it away from us, the idea of those birds uh, yeah. you know, trying to snatch the seed off the ground. That's what we're guarding against uh, there. Yeah, I think the the connection. If you if you want to think about the two images together, the thought of the portion, the inheritance, the treasure, and the promise to to keep or to hold on to it, uh, the way that Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount about n- not laying up treasures on earth, 
where the moth and the rust destroy and thieves break up and steal, you have something better. You have a treasure in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, where thieves can't steal. And I think if, if, you, if you keep that in mind, the promise part of this verse, then the second part, or the Lord's promise, him giving us and him being our portion, then the second part, the prayer, the promise, comes right out of that. Lord, you are my portion, therefore, help. I promise, help me to treasure your words. Help those to be what I, I store up in heaven. And, and rather than storing up things here on earth, I, I think you see how those two things go very closely together. And again, in a way that, that our new man rejoices in that and desires that very thing. Yeah, very beautifully put. Yeah, the, the where thing, you know, we have a great thing, the thing we're looking forward to, and that's what an inheritance is. It's something we don't have yet except by a promise. Uh, but we keep our eyes fixed on what God has promised to give to us, uh, and we don't let the other um, immediate things distract us and um, draw our attention away from the good that God has promised to give us. Yeah, that's a great point. Now, in verse 58, the psalmist prays, I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. That first part, I entreat your favor with all my heart. The, the Hebrew has a bit more a picturesque language there. Take us into to verse 58. Yeah, so in the Hebrew, there's some really wonderful uh, um, words here. Uh, this, uh, where we say we entreat your favor, uh, what what the, the, the Hebrew points us to is really um, asking that we may see the, 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 the sweet face, the pleasant face of God. And when we think of, uh, you know, when as God's children, we want our Father's face turned toward us. Uh, we can think of the benediction at the end of the divine service. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We are asking uh, that God would turn toward us rather than away from us as we deserve. Because we have sinned against him, we have rebelled against his word, we've not kept his word as we ought, we deserve God to turn away and stop looking at us, and that's, that's judgment. But we're asking that instead God would turn his face to look at us uh, in sweetness. As children, we want our fathers, our parents to look at us with a pleasant countenance. We want to see a smile on their face. We want to see their eyes crinkled up in joy looking at us uh, rather than, you know, in anger or to just the, you know, kind of the opposite, to turn away and have nothing to do with us. There's nothing more terrifying than God turning away and not speaking to us. And so the Hebrew really pulls this out that we want to, we want to look into the sweet, pleasant uh, face of our Heavenly Father. Um, why? Because of, uh, as it goes on in the second half, because of his promise. Right? Be gracious to me because of your promise. And this is the, the whole uh, foundation of the Christian's faith. Not that I kept his word, but that he kept his word, that he is faithful, that he is gracious and merciful to us, uh, abounding in steadfast love, um, steadfast love and mercy toward us. And, and that's why we even... Uh, dare to ask it uh, that uh, because God himself has promised it. And if God promises it, then so it shall be. And he is pleased with us when we hold him to account on that word. And say, well, hey, God, this is what you promised. Do according uh, as you have, have said. Um, uh, so this idea of turning to God or, or God turning to us uh, in, in mercy and, in, uh, and in, in pleasantness. And how does he do that? How, you know, we don't see literally the face of God. How does he do that? He has mercy upon us. He forgives us those things of which our conscience is afraid. 
uh, he, uh, he delivers to us the forgiveness of Christ, uh, holds before us uh, the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, the promise of not only the forgiveness of all of our sins, but also the resurrection to eternal life, that inheritance which he himself, as our Father, has promised uh, to his beloved children. Uh, so that's really what we're asking for when we're asking for his favor, and we can think of that any time in the scriptures when we come across that idea of his favor uh, is his mercy, his his good, um, uh, his his that he be pleased with us on account of Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the the language, and I, I know it doesn't the language of God turning his face toward us in favor connected with the idea of portion that brings to mind another another hymn one of one of luther's greatest hymns dear christians one and all rejoice and it, it doesn't use the language of face but it does this idea of god turning to us this is in lutheran service book it's hymn 556 stanza four uh, he turned to me a father's heart he did not choose the easy part but gave his dearest treasure so god for his portion took the took the difficult road of winning salvation of sending his son and that is how i see his his gracious heart and i would say his gracious face is when i look upon christ there is where god shows to me his face with all of his favor and that is where he is gracious according to his promise it's a beautiful thing we're going to keep talking more about this on the other side of the break you're listening to sharper iron on kfuo we're talking to pastor kurt ulmer this morning we will be right back please stick around Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, September 4th. We're studying Psalm 119, verses 57 to 64 with Pastor Kurt Ulmer. He serves at Faith Lutheran Church in Wiley, Texas. Pastor Ulmer, prior to the break, we were talking about verse 58. As we move now into verse 59, the psalmist says, When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimony. So there's a thinking about my ways, but then a turning to what God says. Help us into this language. Sure, and I think the key to this verse is this idea of um, turning, and what that what it really means is to turn around. So when I consider w- what I do, I need to turn. I need to turn away from my own works and turn toward your. Here's one of those many phrases. Uh, words that are used to describe the the word of God here his testimonies um, that we recognize that the word of God is true that uh, indeed the if you narrow it down here if you want to the Ten Commandments this way of life that God has set up that's the good way that's the blessed way that we have uh, been created to walk uh, in love toward God and in love toward our neighbor. And so when I, when I think about um, what I have done and the way I have conducted my life, I turn. I want to turn away from the way of the flesh, the, the way that St. Paul uh, asked, you know, what, what was that gaining you before? Nothing but death. Uh, instead, now we have the way of life, which we have from the Word of God, that portion again, that the goodness of the truth that we have in God's Word. And 
this is something I think Luther picks up on when uh, in his, uh, in talking about uh, confession and absolution. Uh, and, okay, well, what are sins and which are these? He asks a que- he, he directs us to, you know, consider your life according to the Ten Commandments. And we may know the Ten Commandments, but here again we talked about pondering before. This is a time to stop and ponder, we might examine ourselves. Uh, have I walked according to the Ten Commandments? And we can generally say no, right. but do we specifically recognize, according to God's Word, how we have not? There are some wonderful uh, tools out there. I know there's one uh, towards the back of the Treasury of Daily Prayer uh, called a Confession Mirror, which is really just to help us as Christians really dig down into each of the commandments, just ask some questions, so that we don't just skate past the commandments, but really recognize, how have I broken this commandment. Uh, you know, what other gods have I had, for example? Have I trusted in my wealth? Have I trusted in my health? Uh, have I trusted in government? You know, whatever. Uh, any kind of person have I trusted? Um, so that we can specifically find that sin, right? Doctors go in and they try to pinpoint where your cancer is so that they can dig that out. Uh, And that's what we ought to do with the Word of God. Let it shine a light right where it needs to go, and then we turn. We turn away from ours and toward, right, the the way of God, and turn my feet so that I can walk that way. Uh, The ancient church used to talk about two ways that we could go. And here we're talking about going the way of the Word of God, rather than the broad way that leads to destruction. You yeah, know? I think that the confession mirror that you brought up, and that sort of more specific examination that we may neglect at times, I think it's a very helpful thing, both for the sake of identifying those specific sins, those ways that, that I have, in fact, hurt people. It makes it very real in that sense. I can't just kind of skate past it and think, yeah, I'm a sinner, God forgives me, that's great. But I, I actually have to have come face to face with the reality that I've hurt people in my sin, and I think that, that makes it more serious. And I think then on the on the flip side, for the for the sake of the new man, which seems to be more in view here in Psalm 119, that as I think on my ways and I ask those specific questions, God does start to direct my feet now to those testimonies, to desire those good things, those good ways. So, so instead of, you know, as the commandment, uh, the, the confession mirror teaches me to examine my heart to find my sin, and I confess that sin, then I think that also equips specifically through the, as we've been absolved, to then desire those good things and to walk, again, specifically in those ways that I can help people in my daily life to serve them as God intended in those very specific and often such simple ways. You know, I, I do love that part in, in the catechism. You know, think about your, your life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father or a mother? You know, think about the way you've raised your, your kids. Are you a husband or a wife? Think about the way you've, you've treated your spouse. Are you a worker? Have you been lazy? Just those very simple things that, again, show us where we have actually hurt people, and then having been absolved of those sins in the absolution, now turns us toward them to serve them in love. It's a, a, again, I think it's a beautiful tool. Yeah, it, it really is. I found it certainly helpful for myself, um, and uh, it, it helps... Uh, it helps us think clearly and specifically about sin, but also, like you said, specifically about how I love uh, my neighbor, because we can kind of generalize that too and try to define it how we want to, because it's easier. Uh, but this is how God has taught us to love. In fact, there is anything else is not love. We're deluding ourselves, but God shows us Walk this way. This is the way of love. Uh, and how this is why we pray, like at the very end of the psalm in 60, teach me your statutes. Teach mm-hmm. me to know these things um, uh, and to love them. To love yeah. them. 
Yeah. So that, that thought of love, teaching, I mean, the next verse, I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. We we talked about this a couple of sections ago. There's there's a moment in the psalm where the, the psalmist says, I will run. Normally we walk in the way of God's commandments, but there's a running in the way of God's commandments. Here it doesn't say run, but the thought of being quick with my feet, I think the same kind of idea is happening here. Sure. And this is another one of those places where we kind of get caught and we say, ah, uh, I really actually hesitate to do your law, sure. oh God. <laughs> uh, but the new man does. Uh, and certainly, as we said, Christ does. There's no there's no delay. There's no counting. Uh, what may this cost me? What are people going to think uh, if I do this? No. Again, because of what my portion is, I that's where I run. That's what I want is the good. And so this hastening uh, toward the good with great joy. It, it is, it is fill, we are filled with joy to actually walk in the ways of God. And we can, um, we can say that uh, as Christians. We shouldn't just say, well, you know, because I'm a sinner, uh, I, I hate the word of God and those kinds of things. Well, that's true of your flesh, yes. But let's not forget that you are also the redeemed of the Lord. You are his baptized children. And there is an, within you a desire to do what is good. That is the good and gracious working of the Holy Spirit uh, that, that makes you want to do the things of God and at times do them. Uh, yeah. And... Th- th- in Christ, we can do good. Here he says, apart from me, you can't, right. but in me, you can. That's the flip side of, of what he says there, uh, and, and we do it joyfully. That's what faith does. It's, it, this is, you, might talk, you might say this is where we talk about the doctrine of sanctification, that here we're, we're talking about that desire of the Christian, true desire to actually uh, walk in the way of God's word. And not again, not just the commandments, but to order our entire life according to the full counsel of God. And that includes walking according to the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. That it, where, when, what do we get from that? We have a freedom in Christ uh, to love our neighbor, uh, to be free of uh, the fear of the things of the world, freedom from the fear of death and the opinions of men and, and what sinful man might do to us, right? We, we have joy. The Christian faith is not one of just sorrow and being morose and, you know, I'm, I'm miserable because I'm a sinner. Yes, you are a poor, miserable sinner, but you are also a forgiven child of God, and that is a source of joy. We find that all over the scriptures. Even in the psalm, you get the sense that this is a prayer of joy, not sorrow. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, definitely the joy and and the freedom that there is in God's word. It was, a, I think, a couple of sections ago where to walk in God's word is to walk in a wide place, a broad place where there is great freedom, fear for, mm-hmm. or no no fear from danger. There's security in this in this wide place that God gives us to walk, and so we we run, we hasten toward that. And I do, as you reminded us on a couple of occasions here already, thinking of this as the prayer of Jesus. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Think of how he he sets his face towards Jerusalem, mm-hmm. and nothing will deter him from from going to to where he has has gone to do the Father's will for our salvation. Just a, a beautiful connection to to Christ as we think about this as his prayer first and foremost. It's a wonderful gospel. Now you you mentioned because of this we don't need to be afraid of our enemies. The enemies show up in verse sixty one of this section. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me. I do not forget your law. It's a pretty striking imagery about the, what the wicked would do here. Talk to us about this verse. Yeah, so the, you have this idea that's the, pretty all throughout Scripture, this idea of being surrounded. Here, uh, not so much you know, you're in a city surrounded by troops, but you know, there you are standing, and these cords of the wicked are wrapped around you uh, so that you can't move your your bound up, if you will. Uh, and, and that is, we look around ourselves uh, in this life, and everywhere we look, how many times have we lamented 
uh, that, you know, the temptation to sin is everywhere. I mean, you just can't escape it. And these uh, wicked, those who are guilty before God, are here clearly distinguished from the children of God. Uh, and we want to we want to be sure that we're clear. There are those two groups. There are the children of God, and there are those who are not, uh, who are actively in rebellion against God, who are seeking to overthrow his word, to overthrow his church, and to drag uh, his, uh, his children back into uh, the kingdom of the devil. And, and there again, that binding of us uh, so that we just can't move. It feels like we have no way out. Um, uh, but what what does he turn to? I don't forget your law. It, it's really amazing to me. I, I didn't double check to make sure, but I think just about every term for the word of God is used in this little section. Testimonies, precepts, statues. Here we have uh, law. Uh, but again, we ought to think about that uh, more broadly. Um, here, actually, it it is his Torah, uh, which is his instruction, his teachings, and and that is crucial for us to do as we are surrounded not only by the temptation to um, maybe what we might say is committing more gross acts of sin but also we're surrounded by false teaching. And that's the more dangerous thing that I think we often forget is the real danger. Uh, Yeah, sin is definitely dangerous. So is false belief and unbelief. And the devil is a master at uh, filling our ears with false teaching to just slowly turn us away from Christ. It sounds kind of right, but... eh, not totally right, but well, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so what we we are constantly in mind of the Word of God, uh, even though we are surrounded by uh, the wicked, and that that really does describe well the condition of uh, the Christian. Remember, it's an inheritance. It's not something we have in its fullness yet, and so here the church militant continues to fight. Uh, We're surrounded on every side uh, by our enemies, but we know what God has said. We know what God has done and that the victory is ours. That has been accomplished. And we're going to guard that truth with all of our heart because that is our victory. And that is what will sustain us as we continue to fight in this world and make our way uh, to receive the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Hmm. You, yeah. you were mentioning about the various terms for God's word that are used throughout this psalm. This is one of the sections in which all eight of those terms do get used. There's, there's a couple of those throughout this psalm, and this section is one in which all eight of those synonyms get used here. So the, the word Torah, a key word for God's word. Now, verse 62, at midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. So yeah, why, what's going on at midnight? Ah, midnight, well, it's dark, right? It, it, I think this pairs well with verse 61, the mm. cords of the wicked ensna- uh, ensnare me. But also, uh, you know, we can think of the, the parable of the ten virgins, right? We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. Uh, well, how do we wait as Christians? We meditate on his word at all times. And I don't know about you, but at midnight last night, I was not up uh, uh, praising God because of his righteous rules. I was fast asleep. (laughs) If I, if I was awake, it was because of one of my kids, probably. So <laughs> there you not, go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, what this, there are several times uh, that uh, Scripture talks about, you know, it's seven times um, in, actually, I think it's verse 164, uh, where the psalmist says, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules, and mm. 
from that came out the the seven canonical hours. Okay, oh, so we have to stop and pray seven times a day. Well, no, seven is, of course, a number of fullness. We yeah. All our life is a life of praise, including in the night. We never stop uh, being children of God. Uh, we certainly never stop uh, being afflicted by the devil. He can afflict us in our dreams and things like that, uh, trouble us then. Uh, but also simply at midnight, in the midst of my struggles, right, in more of an allegorical sense, in the midst of my struggles, even then will I rise and praise you. Why? Because of your here righteous rules, right, good, saving uh, word, another one of those synonyms. We are praising God for his word. Uh, because that is our life, that is our salvation, that is our confidence, and it, that is our promise of what we have now by faith that will be revealed again in all of its fullness in eternal life. Uh, but that's his praise is continually in our mouths, whether or not we're, we're specifically saying, I praise you, God, even the conversation that we have with our neighbors around us can either be an act of praise of God and his name or not. Yeah. Uh, so at all times. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's when it says at midnight, I think at all times, even if I get up at midnight. That Again, another, another hymn came to mind with that. It's one of the evening hymns, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night, in the fifth stanza. The, that starts like this, when in the night I sleepless lie, my soul with heavenly thoughts supply. So whenever it is, even if I am awake at midnight, Lord, make my, my thoughts, my words be to your praise because of your your righteous rules, because of your your judgments of righteousness is maybe, you know, the mishpatim is, is the word here. Yeah. I, again, this, is, this isn't only just righteous rules, but God's judgments, his justice, his justification according to his righteousness uh, all is in view here. Now, I want to make sure we get to verse 63, because as I mentioned from the toward the beginning of our conversation, Pastor Ulmer, I, I, and I could have missed it or I could have forgotten it, but I don't recall the, the thought of the church being together under God's word as much being in this psalm up until now, and that becomes very much apparent in verse 63. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. Again, I, at least as, as I've been considering it, Perhaps I've been thinking of this more in an individual sense, which is good and right. But here sure. we very much have the church in view, and I think that's a significant uh, thing to talk about. Yeah, it really is, because, you know, how does the Lord's Prayer begin? Our Father. It, it, yes, we individually believe in Christ uh, but we are not individuals. We are, as Paul beautifully paints for us, the picture of the body. Mm -hmm. We are all members of one body. Our head is Christ. Uh, and, um, and so it is very important for us. This is why, you know, we have prayer chains and, and all these things, because we are praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and, and, well, what makes us brothers and sisters? Why, why are we... Um, uh, why are we companions of uh, of these people? Uh, or really, the the Hebrew here, the uh, the haver. We are a unit. Right? We are mm. one thing bound together. That image of marriage again. Uh, just we are one piece. We are bound by right? uh, all who fear you. Those who keep your precepts. So we are united to those who, uh, who confess the same thing according to God's word. That is what binds us together. You know, whether we, you know, live in, you know, Texas or Illinois or in uh, Belize or in China, it doesn't matter. We are all bound by this one word of God, this one inheritance that we share uh, 
True, yes, all those who fear you. That is uh, that is a, a real fear. And in Proverbs, we hear, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not all wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, but to recognize that uh, you are God, I am not, I stand in need of your mercy, just like all of these other people uh, here gathered with me. They are the ones to whom I am bound. We hear Jesus praying for this in uh, his high priestly prayer, um, that they may be one as you, Father, and I are one, inseparably bound to one another. When one suffers, all suffers. When one rejoices, all rejoice together. We don't, we are not islands. What a great gift of God that here, you know, in in the church militant as we are right now, uh, we are not alone. We are not in this this battle uh, together. You know, we think again, the cords of the wicked ensnaring me. That's not just me. There are others, lots of others who are enduring these same things, who can support me, whom I can support, uh, but we are bound to one another by his word, not shared interests or something like that, by that word, the, uh, the keeping, again, guarding that keeping word again, who guard your word, who treasure it. I love them and they love me. What a, oh, that, that is so comforting uh, to think about the church in that way. Uh, as a bound unit, companions, friends of those right. who love the Word of God. Yeah, and, and what a what a wonderful gift that God would give us, the church, in that way, especially when we have the, the wicked with their cords attempting to surround and ensnare. God surrounds and, and I don't know, ensnares, gives, gives to us, binds us together with his people, with those who, who fear him, who love his precepts, who, who hold fast to his Word as, as a defense that that we would stand united again in Christ on him as our solid rock, our foundation. We've got about three minutes here, Pastor Ulmer, and the, the last verse is also beautiful. It says this, The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Here, the, the verse actually begins with the word that's translated your steadfast love. It's perhaps the most famous of the words that begin with this Hebrew letter, K. Kate, the word chesed, the steadfast love. Uh, take us into to this verse. Help us to wrap things up this morning. Yeah, chesed is such a, a beautiful and kind of all-encompassing word. Goodness, kindness, mercy, his loving kindness toward creation. Uh, that the, the earth is full of it. And we look out and we say, really, is it? Uh, but no, it is. And what a joy for us as those who know Christ— who know that Christ has come into our flesh and redeemed us and be, begun to brought healing to creation. We see his miracles that he performs in his earthly ministry as kind of precursors to that full restoration of all things. This is his mercy. He is the mercy of God toward us, and the earth is full of it. Why? Because his word is all over the earth, to the four corners of the earth, uh, wherever we go, we can find the word of God. It might be hard, but there the word God has caused his word to be spread forth to all creation. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and it's good for us to, again, not speak of the world only in terms of sin and evil, but to actually now look as the redeemed at the word of, at the, at the world and see the goodness that God has left in the world despite our sin. Right? There are still, uh, we're still having children. Uh, people are still loving one another and caring for one another. Oh, why? Because his word continues to permeate uh, the earth. And though it's met with resistance, certainly, uh, yet we see our companions all over the world uh, rejoicing in the goodness of God, receiving uh, life and salvation in his name. And and what is the response? Teach me that word, O God. Teach me, uh, teach me your statutes. Exercise me in your word. And that does mean, O Lord, um, uh, uh, on fectung, uh, trials, but exercise my faith that it may be deepened uh, in you, uh, and that um, I may continue to rejoice in the great mercy you have worked for me in Christ, which I know by your word. 
Pastor Kurt Ulmer serves at Faith Lutheran Church in Wiley, Texas. He has been helping us today to study Psalm 119, verses 57 to 64. Pastor Ulmer, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much, Pastor Apple. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this section of Psalm 119, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us again tomorrow morning as we pick up the next eight verses of Psalm 119. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk with you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.